It is asked whether Baltic lands ever enjoyed confederations or unions prior to the kingdom of Mindogas. We, the servants of King Mindogas, were not spoiled by many different stories, but the more inquisitive are aware of the legations of Baltic lands since King Theodoric's times. I had a chance to read the report of the 9th century written by Wolfston. The Aestian land is very big, he wrote. It has many castles, and each of them has its own king. The kings and the nobility drink kumis, while the poor and the slaves drink mead. They often wage wars among themselves. Everything is like today, kings and nobility, the poor and the slaves. In 1009, we come across the name of Lithuania in the description of St. Boniface's life. The Quedlinburg Chronicle, presumably, is talking about a state when he describes the events on the Lithuanian-Russian border. In 1219, our rulers concluded an agreement with the Russian Slavs, the Volina Deci. The delegation was quite solid. No fewer than 21 dukes confirmed it by their hands and seals. There were five supreme dukes among them, Dosprungas with his brother Mindogas, Doyotas with his brother Vilikaila, and supreme of the supreme Jivinbudas. Our people say that unions of Baltic lands with the dukes of lands and supreme dukes were formed long ago, at least at the end of the 10th century. Much depended, though, on the time and the situation. At one time they were ruled from a single center, and at another time they tackled their problems individually. Events of the early 13th century upset the habitual contraposition and equilibrium of us, the Bolts and Slavs. Military Christian orders appeared on the political arena and brought with them the interests of the Supreme Pontiff and the Holy Roman Empire. The orders broke into our life at an incredible speed. By the year 1236, the sword-bearers had conquered the Livians, Latgalians, and Estonians, the occupied parts of Coronian, Semigallian, and Selian lands. Prior to 1240, the Teutonic Order, set up in Prussian Kulm, conquered the Prussians, enslaved part of the Nadruvians, Scalvians, Jutvingians, and Suduvians. The fall of numerous Baltic lands in less than two decades shocked our dukes and put forward an immediate task of turning the confederation into a single state, which was well adjusted to the war situation. They say that at the time when the Volina peace treaty was concluded, our king Mindogas was young. In 1219 he was 23 years of age. Already at that time, together with his brother Dosprungas, he was the third in the line after the supreme duke Jivunbudas, as well as Doyotas and Vilikaila. Dosprungas died around 1238 and left two sons, Dotvidas and Edividas. But even at the time when he was still alive, in 1236, the Livonians titled Mindogas the Supreme Duke, and describing the events of 1245, they titled him as the Supreme King and the Lord of the Lithuanian land. We witnesses of those events understand the reasons of Mindogas' activity. In 1231, the Teutonic Knights set out from Kulm in the direction of Prussian lands. In 1236, the Livonian sword-bearers made the last assault, as they put it, in an attempt to conquer the Semigitians and Semigallians. In 1240, Bati conquered Russian lands, and in the neighborhood of Lithuania, in Christburg, Pomezanian, Varmian, and Notangian Prussians surrendered to the Teutonic Order. Apparently, it was not by chance that Mindogas united Lithuania. All Lithuania obeyed him. Parbus from Nerisland, Gerdanus from Nalsia, Bikshis and Ligekis from Deltova. The Duke of Apite conformed to him. The southern Sela, Nadrova, and Skala, as well as the northern Sudova, inhabited by Jutvingians, recognized his authority. He established himself in Black Russia as well, and allowed his son, Vaishvilkas, to rule its major part. New winds started blowing in 1249, when Mindogas found out about the military failures of Dosprungas' sons, Dotvilas and Edividas, in Russia. He took the lands which his nephews had ruled and sent troops to fight them. When Samogitian Duke Vikinthus, the winner of the Sun Battle and the uncle of the wronged nephews, learned about that, he revolted against Mindogas. Vikinthus, Dotvilas, and Edividas found asylum in the estate of Halician Duke Daniel. Using his support, they devastated Mindogas's Black Russia, brought Vikinthus's Samogitia and Jutvingians over to their side, and discussed joint actions with the Bishop of Riga. At the beginning of 1250, Dotvilas came to Riga. Livonians considered him to be the lawful contender to the throne of Lithuania. 
Bishop Nicholas of Riga, Christian Totvilas, and the Livonian allies organized two big campaigns to Lithuania. They devastated Nalsha, Mindaugas' patrimony, and the part of Samogitia that was supporting Mindaugas. Mindaugas managed to surmount it by starting talks with the second authority of Livonia, the Grand Master of the Order, Andrew of Stirland. The master proposed the crown to Mindaugas, but on a very strict condition. Mindaugas had to be Christianed. Mindaugas accepted the proposal and was Christianed in 1251. After the Christianing, Livonian and Lithuanian envoys set out to meet Pope Innocent IV. Andrew of Stirland obtained the king's crown for Mindaugas. On the 6th of July, 1253, a special envoy of the Pope Bishop of Kulm Heidenreich and two Catholic bishops crowned Mindaugas and his wife Morta. Mindaugas became the first king of Lithuania and Lithuania became a Christian kingdom. Between 1253 and 1259, Mindaugas granted part of the land of his state to the order in return for the military and diplomatic support. We could read one such paper. In October 1255, Mindaugas wrote, Mindaugas, by the grace of God, the first king of Lithuania, will allocate to the Livonian land, master and brethren, for the free and eternal use, the Selen land. United Lithuania had many dukes who stayed submissive to Mindaugas. Samogitia enjoyed special rights. In the period of 1252 to 61, it operated like a confederation of lands. The great victory of Samogitians, who were led by Trenota and supported by Mindaugas in the Durbia battle against the joint army of the Teutonic and Livonian orders, as well as Danes and Swedes, aroused great expectations of freedom. Coronians and Semigallians revolted and the great Prussian insurrection began. The new distribution of powers faced our king with a dilemma, to stay a Livonian ally or, urged by his nephew Trenota, to become a proponent of the independence of Baltic lands. In 1261, King Mindaugas officially renounced Christianity, broke peace with the Livonian order and started a war against German knights and supported Prussian rebels. In the same year, Mindaugas formed a coalition against the order. It was joined by Nogardas, Totvilas's Polotsk and Vitebsk, but they failed to organize a joint march to Livonia. Although in 1263 Trenota defeated the forces of the order in an open battle near Dolgovgriva, he failed, however, to capture any fortified castles. Trenota's battles in 1262 were also successful in Mazovia and the lands of Teutonic order. It happened so, however, that the policy of our king and Trenota started parting. The king directed Lithuanian forces towards Russia. In 1262, he fought in Volhynia and next year sent his army to Bryansk. Meanwhile, Trenota was preoccupied with the western borders. Political discord was heated by King Mindaugas himself. In 1262, Queen Morta died, and the king took away the wife of the Duke of Nalsha, Domantas, who was the sister of the late Morta. That was the main reason for the conspiracy that ensued. In the autumn of 1263, Mindaugas was murdered, together with his sons Ruklis and Dropeikis. Duke Domantas murdered the king of Lithuania. The power was taken over by Trenota, and the murderer evaded punishment. Thus, both Trenota and Domantas were conspirators. After the death of King Mindaugas, our state did not fall apart. Battles for the king's throne began.